Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm back for my holiday in the UK, a visit to CoxCon, as well as a little bit of time spent with the family up in Newcastle. It was very pleasant. Unfortunately, what happens when you're self-employed is that any holiday is basically you losing a ton of money, which is exactly what happened while we were away. No videos, unfortunately. But I did get a chance to play a few games, and I was thinking to myself, I actually play a lot of games on a weekly basis, but I don't play many of them for a long time. We get a large number of review copies and preview builds in every week for games, and I think to myself, I can't cover these. You know, there's really not a lot I can do with it, but I do spend a little bit of time on as many of them as possible, and most of them just don't make it to video. It's really as simple as that. And I'm sure the devs would like a little bit of exposure, and I'd like to sort of expose my thought process on those games and maybe give you just a little bit of information. Point you in the right direction. Perhaps you might see something that you are interested in. And I played, at least on PC anyway, six games while I was away of varying quality. So I'm going to show you a couple of minutes of footage of each of them, see what happens. Some of these might end up being bigger videos later on if I decide it's worthwhile, and others may never be mentioned on this channel again. So here we go. There are too many sodding games, so let's have a little look at some of them. First game I had a look at went by the name of Abzu, which is, I would say, a sort of exploration-focused game along the lines of Journey. It's by a company called Giant Squid, and as you can probably tell, it is focused for the most part underwater. Game recommends a controller, and I would agree with it on that one. It generally plays an awful lot smoother with analog controls as opposed to digital. So you might not want to use a keyboard and mouse with it. It's not that it's not playable, it's just it's not exceptional with that particular control method. Unfortunately, it also appears to not have cloud saves, so the 30 or so minutes that I played of it while I was on holiday have apparently been lost. So I guess I'm going to be doing a bunch of swimming again. This is the start of it. And the game is absolutely beautiful. There's no doubt about that, you know, you're sort of immediate, I, although I don't really know what happens with that bit, that seems to sort of a little bit, I don't know, sudden? I'm just not really sure what's all what that one's all about, but as you can see, you play a diver and you're moving through some sort of underwater world. There's no speech from what I can tell or anything along those lines. The game is, for the most part, silent, other than the sound effects in question. You can see you can use keyboard and mouse with it. It's a, it's a bit wonky, but it's not unplayable. But I was immediately struck by how absolutely gorgeous it was, and actually the similarities to Journey seem to exist both in terms of the gameplay and in terms of the way that it looks. You have an awful lot of detail, but you're certainly using a lot of flat textures here and there, and you have an awful lot of color, but you don't necessarily have any real form of authenticity or realism. You know, it's not trying to really do any of those things. It's just trying to present a, a really gorgeous looking world that you have the temptation to explore. You can uh, actually ride this giant fish if you so desire. R riding of animals seems to be a thing as to why. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I haven't actually found a purpose to riding the animals yet other than it's fun to ride fish and manta rays and things like that and kind of do little flips here and there. You know, what it kind of reminds me of in terms of the playfulness of its gameplay is Echo on the Dreamcast. I don't know if you remember that. The first level of Echo was really awesome because outside of you know, the rest of the game, what was really cool about it is that you could just sort of do jump up in the air and do flips outside of the water and everything and breach the water as a, as a dolphin would and everything along those lines, which I found to be extremely enjoyable. As you can see, the controls are a bit finicky with the keyboard and mouse. The music is also absolutely phenomenal. The experience is supposed to be about two hours long, give or take. As to what you actually have to do, I don't really know. I encountered a couple of mechanical doors. I encountered this robot, which was then unfortunately eaten by a shark. This area actually didn't uh, didn't spot this last time. It seems like you can interact with uh, little hidden areas around the place, and that will either summon animals or give you sort of a little bit of weird information about the world. You know, I can try and uh, boost towards and you know, grab this turtle. There we go. And, I, and then you can ride the turtle and maybe make the turtle do flips and all that sort of thing. It's a very relaxing experience as to what the actual game is. It's, that's a little bit tricky to handle. It mostly, I think, is just a get to the end. There are hazards 
of some description. I'd say I have encountered a couple of sharks here and there, so I imagine that there's a, a little bit of that ally journey in there as well, but... I think the inspirations of the game are obviously sort of worn on its sleeve, and I am interested in playing the rest of it. And it seems like there's quite a few nice little things hidden around the place. So if you're looking for something a little bit zen, and of course you enjoy underwater experiences, which I absolutely love, then Abzu may very well be something that should be on your radar at this point. I'm going to see about finishing it, and then I think it may very well be WTF is worthy. So we'll, we'll see how it ends, and then I'll come to that conclusion there. So this game I dabbled in went by the name of Infinium Strike, which promised to be a space-based tower defense in which you actually defended a entire battleship against a fleet of enemies, which I, I found to be sort of a, a really cool little notion. And that was perhaps the reason that I decided to try it, because I have always been like a big fan of space battles whether it be stuff in Star Trek, Star Wars, anything along those lines. So I thought, hey, you know, building a tower defense around the idea of a space battle may very well be quite entertaining. It could also be very visually impressive. So what you do here is you place these different kinds of weapons in different places on the ship. And you can see these four different quadrants which switch, switch between here, one, two, three, and four. And there are different types of rog ships that come in at you. And you try to build the appropriate weapons and use the appropriate kinds of upgrades in order to take those ships out. So there's a lot of uh, little ships on the way here right now. So maybe I would build a couple of different pulse lasers, which are fast firing weapons in order to, to deal with them. I believe you have to, if you build them together, you get something of a bonus. There's actually a, a lot of little ones right now, so maybe I might want to sell that and then uh, grab a second pulse next to that. And then maybe I could upgrade my existing pulse. You'll see damage being done to the ship right there as it gets hit. The, the sound effects are a little, well, weak, I would say. In fact, I mean, a lot of the assets in this game are, you know, I do like the lighting effects that are going on there with the weapons. They look particularly good, but the ships aren't particularly well rendered. Uh, their attacks don't look particularly powerful either, I and mean, there's very little actual sound asset going on there either. You can also upgrade your ship, and that allows you to upgrade the base depending on you know, how much Infinium and Star credits you have, and that will unlock more turrets. So you can see here, I'll be able to build another turret here, also unlock different kinds of weapon. So if I build a super pulse here, and uh, assuming I have the money for it, which I currently don't, and the size of the portal indicates the size of the enemy that's going to be coming at you. And it's, uh, it's okay, I guess. I mean, I, I like the idea of it. It's an interesting little spin on tower defense. It's not the same kind of tower defense that we usually see. I don't have enough money, as you can see, to actually uh, build this weapon at the moment. You get you get more as you kill more of these little dudes. Can I please have a heavy pulse? That would be lovely. There we go. And it's a nice light show. I'm not 100% convinced about whether or not I would continue to play it. The tutorial didn't exactly leave much room for me thinking that there would be an awful lot of strategy involved in it. It looks nice, but outside of that, it just seems to be, well, build the right size turret at the right time, sell it at the right time, upgrade it at the right time. What else could you possibly want to do? And also these weapons are limited in the sense that, you know, these large ships right here, I can't even hit them with the heavy pulse laser. I believe I'll actually need an even bigger weapon for that. Which is a little bit unfortunate because you'll see that these enemies are in different sec sectors, I believe. So the far away stuff, these weapons can't even hit them. So if I build the super pulse right now, that should hopefully be able to hit that one over there. Or not. There we go. Now it finally fires. So it's hard to say how much strategy there's going to be later on, really. I, I do like how it looks and I like the theme. I, I don't know if I'm going to continue to play an awful lot of it. You, you can also unlock the ability to launch ships at them, which, again, you know, it looks good. There's no real doubt about that. And I love the idea of defending a large ship. It gives me that sort of Battlestar Galactica vibe, but I'm just not 100% convinced at this point as to whether or not it'll actually have any legs and whether or not I really want to go through these sort of fairly slow and dull missions in order to get to that point and see if it actually does have any real longevity. 
Well, there you go. There, there, there was a mission of that. I'll say, no, nice idea, nice theme overall. Nice to see them trying to change the way that tower defense is actually treated. There are far too many very, very similar tower defense games, no doubt about that. But I will have to endure it, maybe, you know, play through a few more missions and see if it really gets anywhere, because it doesn't seem to really have a lot of momentum right now. All right, and as we get tased right here, we have a little game called Intrude. This was sent over, and I did see a, a video of this, I believe, when we were doing the release list of the Co-Optional Podcast, and it advertised itself as an old-school style shooter, which is exactly what it is, by a fellow called uh, Macal Kruber. I, I believe it is a, a one-man effort. And when I saw the screenshots, I thought to myself, oh, this game might very well be trying a little bit too hard. I've thought to myself for a while that an old school style shooter would work. You know, if you look at Doom, even without any of the mods and different interpreters and engines that are available for it, Doom, for some reason, still looks pretty reasonable. It's got almost this timeless aesthetic, like, kind of like how Sonic does. You know, you wouldn't say Sonic has bad graphics at this point, you know, it, it still looks really, really great because the art style was essentially timeless. And I think Doom is probably one of those games that also falls into a similar category. But then I looked at Intrude and I'm like, this is is very grey. I mean, this, this game actually looks, you know, worse than Doom despite it being released 20 years later or whatever. The enemies don't really appear to have anything distinguishing about them. It's just mostly generic, different colored goons. The weapons aren't all that inspired. And I actually looked at the weapon list. It's definitely not very inspired. It's about as generic as you get. And even the wall textures and the actual environments don't really inspire me either. You know, this is supposed to be a, an old prison, but I remember being much more intrigued by the different colors and textures and environments, even in the first level of Wolfenstein 3D. It actually had several things like that, as well as, you know, a lot of decoration that really invoked the theme. A lot of uh, portraits of Hitler and swastikas and golden eagles all over the place. Whereas this, like, what, what does this really invoke the theme of? It invokes the theme of a gray warehouse for the most part. And I actually played a few levels of this. Again, a game that doesn't have cloud save. So I don't really feel particularly inclined to play through these levels again. And I just felt, one, lost. You know, the game doesn't have a map and many of the wall textures are extremely similar, which means that navigating the level can be an absolute pain. You know, you're, you're better off navigating by fallen bodies, which is okay, but you know, there are so few different textures and decals that everything looks the same, so you end up getting turned around very easily. And the gunplay just really isn't anything to write home about. It doesn't have a great weapon variety or enemy variety. It also has the same music on multiple levels, which I think is a big mistake, you know. It, Wolfenstein 3D and Doom have a lot of different music per level and that was absolutely phenomenal but you're playing multiple levels within the same episode that all have exactly the same music and the music is very repetitive yeah it, it feels certainly old school but they are very very short loops obviously doom inspired you can hear the old school synths that are supposed to sound like uh, cheesy electric guitars in the background but uh, to me, it doesn't really invoke any of the horror of Doom. It doesn't have a particularly interesting design. It's solid enough. Like, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, per se. There's just absolutely nothing inspired about it, either. And it just reminds me that for every Doom, Wolfenstein 3D, and so on and so forth, there are a million and one copycats in this genre back in the day that felt and played exactly like this and did nothing to distinguish themselves. And that hasn't changed just because we happen to be in 2016, I'm afraid. So I, I don't have any more desire to play any more of Intrude. Little King Story. Oh, oh, oh. This is why you're not allowed to get excited for video games ever, by the way. So this is a game that was absolutely phenomenal on the Wii if you were willing to overlook its technical limitations. And when I heard that it was going to come to PC, I was ecstatic because that game ran really poorly on Wii. It ran really poorly when it was ported to Vita. And I thought, hey, the PC will manage it. I just want to point out, by the way, this game is chugging on my Titan... And no, no, I don't have a Titan X anymore. Sorry, that was last week. Yes, uh, the 1080s. Yes, those. I, I am... Uh, it boggles my mind. I, I, can't, I don't think anyone can actually get this game running at 60. I mean, the warning signs were clearly there when I started. The game did not recommend 60 in its Japanese-style launcher. That, that's never a good sign, and unfortunately, things only get worse from there on in. Uh, the game barely controls with the keyboard and mouse. The camera control is awful. You have to go back with Q and E. It has no mouse support whatsoever. Oh, yeah. 
that it that little freeze right there that was when the game decided oh instead of having an options menu we're literally going to freeze the game and ask you whether or not you want to exit if you hit the escape button in order to actually talk to anyone you have to stand in a very very specific place Without a controller, the game is almost unplayable. Even with a controller, it's a pain in the ass. I can't even remember what button I have to press in order to get any of these guys to join me. Uh, the point of the game uh, is something of a mix of Pikmin, My Life as a King, which was a sort of spin-off on Wii, and uh, Animal Crossing. You know, and the game is really, really interesting. You know, it's a very unique genre-melding title. The problem is the PC port is just absolutely horrible. The 60 FPS mode will not run at 60. I don't think on any system. Uh, right now, on mine, it's chugging. It was chugging on my laptop. It, it chugs on everything. Jim Sterling was reporting the same thing. And, and it certainly doesn't look like it deserves it. And apparently there are a bunch of physics-based problems and crashes that are related to running it at 60. So unless you're willing to tolerate 30 FPS... Ah, uh, God, it, it's just such a horrific disappointment. It, it's so unfortunate. It didn't run well on any of the other systems, but I was hoping it was just sheer raw power would do the job. You would think, but no, apparently it, it is coded by, by people that just have no idea what they're doing. Backspace to recruit, by the way. Yeah, very, very logical there. <laughs> Let's not bother having any key prompt pop key prompt pop-ups. I've done it again. I hit it again. Oh, how, how do you even get out of this menu? Apparently, it is backspace, but it's also backspace to recruit because, of course, it is. Yes, ab absolutely. Oh man, if you're willing to deal with the you know, the 30 FPS, you know, it's such a really cool genre melding game, but. That's three for three now on bad versions of Little King's story, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm just getting horribly tired of it. Such a disappointment. I'm never allowed to get excited for games or ports ever again. Thank you, Japan. Slain. Oh, Slain. Good lord, you were a massive disappointment when you first came out. But this time around, what we have is a little bit of a redemption story, which is rather lovely. We don't get those all that often, but... I did make a point on the Corruptional Podcast that I will continue to reiterate. It's that there's no such thing as too little too late when it comes to modern game development. Because thankfully, we live in the digital age and stuff can be fixed. So back when Slain first came out, people were very interested in it because of its aesthetic and because of its music. You know, it was described as a heavy metal platformer, which to me, of course, was a huge attraction. But it turned out to be awful. Mostly because it was horribly unresponsive, incredibly challenging, unfairly so, and the combat was mostly just bash the same button over and over again. The AI on the enemies was incredibly dumb, there was basically no feedback on hitting anything, so it didn't feel satisfying at all. And the only defensive move that you had at the time, I believe, was this backwards dodge that at the time was far less responsive than it currently is. Now, what the guy did is he re-released it, with an updated version called Back From Hell or Back To Hell, one way or the other. And he put a few new combat mechanics in it. He really tightened the game up an awful lot. For instance, there's now a, a charged attack, which feels really satisfying. It's got a lot of nice gore. There's a nice little bit of satisfying temporary slowdown when it happens. And you also have critical counters and a block move now as well, which is a hell of a lot better than just having the dodge backwards button, which at the time had so much delay on it that it was almost pointless to even and do it. Now, you can hold down the block button, and also if you block at the absolute perfect time, which I'm ne probably never going to get right, you get the opportunity to respond with a hugely powerful counter, which is really fun to use, and looks like that, which is a lot better. You know, I'm a bit of a sucker for counter into slowdown into massively heavy hit that forces the enemy to explode in a pile of gore. You know, I think that's a pretty solid mechanic. It's the kind of thing that's done in a lot of Platinum games, which I very much enjoy. The idea of witch time and really cool counter-attacks like that. that. Slow the game down and let you just immerse yourself and enjoy the moment. Now the game has a little bit of that, and there are much, much better ways of dealing with large groups of enemies as opposed to just hacking and slashing your way through them, which I dig. The game is definitely challenging, there's no doubt about that. Would I say it's unfair? No, but I will say that the... Oops. You know, I shouldn't have mentioned that, really. 
the distance between the checkpoints can be a little bit excessive at times. So that means you're replaying a lot of segments over and over again because you can quite easily die. And while the game certainly says that it, it has improved AI, which it does, it definitely does, it's certainly possible to exploit the enemies in a wide number of situations. You know, I've taken out a lot of the, the big bosses by just sitting on a level below them, and then just as soon as they reach the end of the platform, before they jump down, just hacking at them repeatedly, and they'll just get stun-locked, essentially. And that was a problem that the original game had, but it's a lot more fun now, I would say. You know, before that, it was an absolute avoid because the game was utterly hopeless. Now, I would say it's got much better combat feedback, it, the enemy AI is a lot better. It's a lot more satisfying to kill stuff. You've got actual defensive moves that you can use, and there's a combat system which involves just, you know, a little bit of learning and a little bit of nuance and mastery. So, as a side-scrolling hack-and-slash brawler platformer with a really cool aesthetic, I, I have to admit, you know, it, it definitely is a metal platformer. This reminds me of the album cover of many power metal or indeed thrash bands. It's a lot more solid, you know, it's the kind of thing that, you know, were this now on sale, I would happily say, you know what, you might want a little bit of a bash at this, because it is aesthetically pleasing, and the combat is really quite satisfying. Cool little redemption story, isn't it? I love those, I really do, I really do, I need to learn to not suck at this, but for once it is my fault and not the game's fault, which would not be true prior to the release of this new version. There's no really doubt, no real doubt about that. You know, it was absolutely awful, and you'll find consensus on that particular point. So, welcome back, Slain. The form you should have been in in the first place. But hey, no such thing as too little, too late. That's cool. And the last, well, video game on the list that I played, plenty of physical ones, but we can't really look at those right now, is This is the Police. It's by Weappy, and it was actually kickstarted. And it's a mixture of something like a choose-your-own-adventure game with a visual novel and a set of basic management mechanics in which you are the somewhat corrupt chief of police at the head of a corrupt police department who is involved with uh, the Mafia and various other nasty things. From what I can tell, most of the characters in this game are not very pleasant. And that seems to somewhat be the point. As to where it's based, it's hard to say. It, it seems to be influenced by American society to some degree, but as to when it is set, that that's a little bit tricky. It doesn't seem to really specify the date. There's no actual real place involved in it. And... You also have this uh, nice little selection of music right here, which actually seems to indicate that it is certainly not set in modern day whatsoever. Now, it's got a very gumshoe and sort of noir kind of theme to it, which indicates, of course, that this game is actually set somewhat in the past, and as a result, whatever issues it was tackling would be relatively, one would think, relevant to that particular time. You've got to bear in mind, of course, that the people that made this are actually from Belarus, which is probably not a country you know a huge amount about, and that's very much going to have influenced the way that they developed this. Now, wh why am I bringing all this up? Because a couple of people stamped their feet about this, and it bothered me that they did that, because we hear time and time and time again that apparently games need to grow up. Games need to tackle grown-up issues. Games need to tackle cultural issues, but simultaneously games have to be culturally aware, so better not tread on too many toes, despite the fact that your game is set in an imaginary world, a fictional world. We've seen issues lately with Deus Ex and the idea of Org Lives Matter, which for some reason upset people, which is a little odd because one would think that, oh god, I'm gonna dive into it, am I? It's gonna happen! It's gonna happen! <laughs> one would think if one believed that the Black Lives Matter movement was truly important and historically significant, that it would be referenced by other movements in similar situations at some point in the future, such as, say, a dystopian future. Ergo, referencing that, assuming you handled it correctly, which of course nobody really knows if they will or won't because they haven't played the game yet, would be complementary to said movement and supportive of it, not an insult or so-called appropriation, whatever that means. 
This is one of many examples of this being an issue. There were a couple of different outlets that got upset that this game had some racist overtones. Uh, it does. Uh, it, it, de it definitely does. There's, there's no real doubt about that. The game challenges you quite early on to fire all of the black cops. Uh, they, they, they're making excuses as to why they have to do that. They... Uh, basically kowtowing to so-called racist gangs in the city. They believe that it's better to fire the black cops than have them be killed and that be a PR disaster. You could certainly interpret that as racism. Yes, absolutely. Racism within the context of the game. That doesn't make the game racist. It doesn't make your character necessarily racist for carrying it out. I have difficulty relating to people that don't seem to understand that you can roleplay a character that doesn't exactly reflect your own political views. Or that you can roleplay a character who does things that would make you feel uncomfortable or be forced into a situation that is not optimal and that you wouldn't actually really do. Uh, if anything, that's one of the greatest strengths of games. It gives you the ability to do that, to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. And that's a very much an adult form of entertainment. That to me is very compelling and I like it when games do that. I like it when games challenge my preconceptions. I like it when games upset me. I like it when games make me feel uncomfortable. Because I want them to make me feel something. You know? It doesn't just have to be adrenaline and excitement. And this game does that. But so far, I've found that there's a little bit of a, a, a tonal clash. You know? I don't mind the whole idea of Fire All the Black Cops. I don't mind the fact that one of the characters references the Japanese by what could be considered a racial slur. Because that's what... A regular person might do at this time they may or may not that person may be racist okay that's a character in a video game maybe they are racist but that all clashes you know that form of grit clashes with some of these crimes that you have to answer so the way that the game works is you have a shift of police officers and you have to dispatch them. It's a resource management game for all intents and purposes to various locations. You can see right here that we've uh, we've gone to a, a car theft, some kind of carjacking in the suburb, and now I have to make some choices and that may or may not affect what's going to happen here. So do I want to open fire on the stolen vehicle? Probably not. I, I'm thinking that overtake the offender and block the road might be a sensible idea. And based on the competency of your officers, you get a success or failure chance, but that Successful failure chance is generally hidden. So I sent some pretty high-ranked officers right here. They have high professionalism, as they call it, which means that I dealt with the carjacking. Carjacking was great, but did you notice that crime earlier about pouring someone into a vat of boiling chocolate? It's, uh, that was a bit of a weird one. And you know, the stuff like, hey, Clown Rob's Balloon Museum or something on those lines. And then you have this hostage situation of apparently literal child torture. As far as I can tell, anyway. What, what sort of bothers me about these crimes is that you don't get a great deal of explanation as to what's actually going on here. You know, I want to know the end of the story, other than the perp got away, or an officer got killed, or we successfully arrested the perp. You know, there's, there's really not a lot of that. Uh, a lot of the story seems to be inside the cutscenes and what's going on with your main character, who is the chief of police, who is involved in the mafia, is basically trying to get to retirement, who is being pressured out by the corrupt mayor, who is an awful person, and is also doing awful things, but doing them perhaps in such a way that they could be overall beneficial. You know, a lot of ends justify the means sort of thing going on there. You know, the character seems uh, quite multi-layered, actually, and the storytelling got me a little bit intrigued in that respect. But it's the day-to-day -day stuff, you know, the crime stuff, that doesn't really give me that narrative satisfaction. Now, let's see what's going on with that. You know, this, this sounds reasonable, you know, this is... Not one of the comedic crimes. We'll send uh, one high professionalism fellow over there. I'm sure he can deal with that. Uh, so that, that's what a lot of stuff is going on there with. But you also have these little tasks that you can take up for the mafia or the corrupt people around the city. So we've got someone who refuses to pay their debts. Will I send the police to help out? I can refuse or I can send someone along and that'll earn me a little bit extra money for my inevitable retirement. And there's a couple of other systems that seem to be being unlocked in the process. If you go to affairs, you can deal with the city hall, you can make requests, but if you don't actually fulfill the request to city hall, so just fire all the black cops in time, then you're less likely to get what you want. If you head over to the police, police station, you can hire new people and you can look for your personnel. You can try and get rid of some of the people who are troublemakers. You can try and fire them legally or illegally. So you could even force them into a situation where they they fail a couple of 
attempts to head off a crime and you could fire them on that basis by deliberately sending a, a low professionalism person in. You, I mean, hell, you could send someone in who is clearly not capable of the task and get them killed or something along those lines. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff sort of going on there. Oh, there is the, uh, the whole mission that you had to fire all the black cops. And if you head on over to investigations, there's also something of a minigame going on there. You have different cases, and apparently there are active gang investigations. You can assign your detectives to these different cases. So let's say I can take... Uh, I think Beasley might be... Is he here? Yep, we can let's, uh, assign... Yeah, let's assign three detectives to this case. And what you can then do is you can head into the case itself, and once the detectives have worked on it, they can provide you with different witness statements and photos and so on and so forth and you have to piece together the investigation which i, I found to be kind of awesome you could reopen the case right here and there's apparently there's apparently a robber here so we can put someone uh, on the lead right there and then once you go into it you'll see a couple of different pictures and you're trying to figure out you know what exactly happened here and there's a little bit of puzzle solving there, and there's unreliable witness elements and all that sort of thing and just be introducing different systems as we go through and i'm compelled to continue to play it there's definitely a, a pleasing amount of grit and unpleasantness in this game, which I think if you're going to deal with the concept of the police, then you're going to have to deal with ideas like that. And that, to me, is a good thing. And you're also dealing with the notion that, you know, that the police are not perfect. In fact, nobody's perfect. And, you know, that we had a false alarm there, as you can see, which, again, you know, is a little bit of a comedy element. But it just... It just it clashes a little bit, you know? It, there's that tonal inconsistency with uh, the serious stuff and the idea that everyone is just not very nice and are kind of looking out for themselves alongside these weird, wacky cases of, hey, you know, the clown did this or whatever. It's not a big deal, but, you know, it, it sort of rode me the wrong way, you know? Am I concerned about playing somebody who's clearly not a very nice person who appears to be quite misogynist, who appears to be very corrupt, who's willing to get people killed for his own ends. No, I don't have a problem with that because that's the nature of role-playing and as an adult I can distinguish fantasy from reality. Wow, what a what a notion, right? And I think it does add very much to the game. You, know, you can't really be a goody two-shoes in this and maybe it brings up the question if it's ever truly possible to be so and that police work is certainly more complex, I think, than most people give it credit for. There's a lot of political nonsense going on behind the scenes, a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy, yeah. Some people may get into the the line of work to do the right thing and end up doing the wrong thing, you know. Do you watch The Shield and root for the main characters? Well, sometimes you do until you realize that they're awful, and that's kind of how I feel about the main character in this as well. Not so much of an anti-hero, but just a human. Somebody who may very well be a bad person, but is still capable of good things and is still capable of doing good things for the city. Because, you know, people are complicated like that. And I like it when games actually attempt to address that. Throw a rubber sex doll at the assailant. Did that work? Yes. But did it tell me what happened afterwards? No. Which is, again, a little bit disappointing. Again, it's such a, a, a weird... You know, it's a really weird tone of clash there. But I'm intrigued to see what happens with the rest of the game. You know, you're getting cutscenes, which are very nicely drawn. Uh... The sort of almost a rotoscoped flashback or another world style of graphics going on with that, which uh, which I definitely dig. Now we've got some some new frames for this investigation. You've got some clues from different witnesses, some of whom are unreliable. So you got to try and put the sequence together to see what happens, and it's unlocking more and more mechanics as I go through. So I do want to play through. Actually, I'm very intrigued to see what goes on with the rest of this as the police. This will certainly be something that I think I'll be doing a WTFS on because. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty immersed in it up to this point. You know, I don't think the the management element is particularly great. You know, it's it's fairly basic resource management of hey, you know, don't send everybody out to the same crime, prioritize different crimes, all that sort of thing. But simultaneously, I think that the storyline might keep me going, and the choose your own adventure element very much may be something that keeps me interested. The weird amalgamation, you know, a bit of a genre masher, but also tackling a subject which isn't tackled all that often. And in a very blunt way, you know, it's got some very rough edges around the story and the presentation, and that can at times be shocking because you don't necessarily expect to see a racist term just pop up in a game like that, but ultimately these developers are not from America, their viewpoint is not Americentric, and it's a piece of fiction. We have to take everything said within the context of the people saying it, 
who are, of course, not real, very human, and no doubt very flawed. I turned into a little bit of a screed there, and I wasn't so happy about that, but it seemed like maybe the the only time that I could really bring that up. Maybe it'll pop up in the video, but I'm not so comfortable dealing with that, you know, it's sort of encroaching into territory that I don't feel I'm personally built to handle. But I'm sick and tired of... The Americentric, close-minded attitude of people that haven't even left their city, judging people from completely different countries, developing their particular form of fiction based on perhaps their experiences and their worldviews that were shaped by growing up in a completely different environment. Now, we ask for diversity in video games. Well, I'm sorry, but stuff like This is the Police is diversity in video games. We want to hear stories from different places that are not just white America. Well... Have a look at Belarus, then. You know, can you even point to it on a map? Of course you can't. All right, that's an interesting ending to Too Many Sodding Games. Just a sort of a little series that I want to put together that wraps up briefly some of the games that I've been looking at and tells you whether or not to expect a video in the future. I do get a lot of review codes every week, like 20 to 30 different games, so expect to see a little selection of those in this video maybe on a on a weekly basis is what we're aiming for one per week for this one toss in some recommendations and some feedback if you would like to at cynicalbritofficial.reddit.com that's cynicalbritofficial.reddit.com if you enjoyed the video then by all means do feel free to click the like button if not the dislike button is right over there i'll see you next time